What's up my stat stars, Michael Princhak here for the Unit 2 Summary Review video over exploring two variable data. In this video, we're going to cover all the major concepts, all the major themes from Unit 2. But before we begin, I want to mention two really important things. First, this is just a review video. I'm not going to go over all the teeny, teeny, tiny details, formulas, and definitions that you may have learned, because that's what you were supposed to learn when you were in class. We're just going to cover the big ideas, the big concepts that are going to allow you to perform really well on the AP stats test and on your unit test. The second thing I have is an awesome study guide that corresponds with the material in this video. So please get out that study guide. Feel free to pause the video, fill it out as need be, or you can watch the full video and fill it out at the end, whatever you want. But I also have the answer key. How do you access that study guide and answer key? Please visit the video link below and you will have access to the ultimate review packet. There's a free trial. You should get a lot of stuff for free right now. It contains lots of great stuff, practice sheets, study guides, everything you need to know and do to make sure you are ready, not just for your unit test, but for the AP stats test in May. All right, let's get ready to dive right into unit two. Unit two covers exploring two variable data. That's taking one set of data and collecting two variables from it. We then analyze those two variables and how they possibly are related to each other. Again, one set of data, two variables collected from it. Maybe that's one sample of frogs and their lengths and their weights were measured. Or maybe that's one sample of hospital patients and their ages and how long they stay at the hospital was recorded. Maybe it's one sample of kids and we track their age and their TV watching habits. The idea is one sample with two variables measured from it. But the major theme here is discovering how those two variables are related or associated. So maybe we wanna look at how the lengths of a frog are related to the weights of the frogs, or maybe we wanna look at how the age of a patient is related to how long they stay at the hospital if they have to go. Or lastly, maybe we want to look at how the age of a child has something to do with their TV watching habits. It's all about discovering the relationship between those two variables that we measured. The unit is broken down into analyzing two categorical variables and how they are related. And then the second part of the unit is looking at how two quantitative variables are related. In each of these major sections, looking at categorical data or looking at quantitative data, we first take a look at graphs, statistics from the data, but then we really dive into how can we determine that those two variables are related. Now, maybe we see patterns in our data, maybe we don't, and those patterns that we see might be random and they might not, but they're gonna provide us critical information to help us determine if those two variables have any type of relationship whatsoever. First, let's start with analyzing one set of data where we collect two categorical variables from that set of data. The best way to organize and understand our data is with what's called a two-way table. Let's take a look at one now. Here's a two-way table where we looked at a sample of students and we asked them two questions. First, how did you get to school? What was your mode of transportation? And second, were you tardy at least once in the last week? From a table like this, we could calculate some sample statistics. Now, why are they called sample statistics? Well, because they come from a sample. Remember, statistics is the word that we use for any information that is taken from a sample. We have several different types of statistics that we can gather from one of these two-way tables for categorical variables. First, what we have are what are called marginal relative frequencies. Here, we're looking at the values that are in the totals. That's why it's called marginal, because the totals are in the margins of the table. We can either look at the proportion of all the kids that were tardy at least once that week, or the proportion of kids that were not tardy at least once that week, we could also look at the margins for the different types of transportation, like the proportion of kids that rode the bus, the proportion of kids that walk to school, the proportion of kids that drive themselves to school, or the proportion of kids that get a ride from their parent to school. But again, we calculate these values from the totals by dividing it by the grand total, hence the marginal relative distributions. Next up, we have what's called joint relative frequencies. When we say the word joint, we basically mean the word and. So we're combining any two of the categories together. For example, we could look at the proportion of kids that were tardy and rode the bus. Or we could look at the proportion of kids that walk to school and drive themselves to school. For a joint relative 
frequency, we're looking at a specific value that matches for those two variables in the table, and again, dividing by the grand total. Lastly, we have conditional relative frequencies. These are a little bit more confusing, but once you get the hang of it, it's really simple. The idea is there's a condition attached, and when there's a condition attached, it changes the value in the denominator. For example, you'll see given a student is tardy, what proportion of them ride the bus to school? So the condition is that it's given that they were tardy. That means our denominator is only limited to looking at the kids that were tardy because it was given, right? There was a condition attached. We know that the student that we're talking about was tardy to school. So our denominator becomes much, much smaller because we're only looking at those students that were tardy. And of those tardy students, how many of them rode the bus to school? So we take how many rode the bus to school and were tardy, and we divide it by the total that were tardy to get our conditional relative frequency. Another example we see here is given that they walked to school, what proportion of them are tardy? This time the condition, what is given is that they walked to school. Once again, that limits our denominator to only looking at kids that walked to school because that's the condition, that's what we know. The numerator is both walking to school and tardy. So take that value divided by the total of kids that walk to school and you'll have your conditional relative frequency. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. For all three of those statistics that we looked at, marginal, joint, and conditional, notice that we looked at the relative frequencies. We didn't look at just the counts or how many. Why is that? Because when you have unequal sample sizes or again, a different amount of kids that walk to school, different amount of kids that take the bus to school, different amount of kids are tardy, different amount of kids that are not tardy, it makes more sense to compare proportions or percentages or what's relative to the whole. If we just look at counts, it's not really fair because some, you know, more kids might take the bus to school, less kids might walk to school. So just looking at counts isn't really a fair comparison. But if we're going to compare probabilities and proportions within these tables, it makes way more sense to look at relative frequencies, which are proportion-based. Two-way tables can also be turned into some pretty sweet graphs called segmented bar graphs. Here we see a segmented bar graph where we've broken down the bars by mode of transportation. And then within each mode of transportation, we're separating the proportion of kids that were tardy and the proportion of kids that were not tardy in that mode. So basically we're looking at conditional relative frequencies here because the first bar is only for those kids that ride the bus. And of those kids, what proportion are tardy, what proportion are not. So we can see the breakdown for each mode of transportation. We can also switch that around and now have each bar representing the proportion of kids that are tardy and the kids that are not tardy. So the first bar we see here is all the kids that were tardy and then the breakdown of what proportion of them ride the bus, what proportion of them walk to school, what proportion of them drive to school, and what proportion of them get a ride from their parent. And then we also see the same thing in the bar that's marked the total kids that were not tardy. Again, each segment is the proportion of the different modes of transportation. So we could switch it up and it's all provided the same amount of information. It's really just a matter of what the condition is. Is the condition the mode of transportation or is the condition being tardy or not? That would determine how you create the segmented bar graph. But segmented bar graphs show the proportions within each of those conditions. They make for great ways to display the data and really understand what's going on within the data. Now, the really important thing we want to do here is determine if there is any type of an association or relationship between these variables of mode of transportation and being tardy or not. Now, to do this, we really have to take a look at the marginal relative frequencies versus the conditional relative frequencies. Now, please note, when we say that there is an association between two variables, we mean that they are not independent. An association means that one variable has something to do with the other variable and vice versa. If two variables are independent, they actually have no association whatsoever, which means one variable does not impact the other. Let's dive into this example to talk about if there is an association or not. Here's how we can actually explore the relationship between these two quantitative variables. So first we want to take a look at the marginal relative frequency. For example, what proportion were tardy at least once? So here we see the marginal, again, 65 out of 188 kids, or about 34.6% of all the students surveyed were tardy at least once. Then what we want to do is we want to compare to that the conditional relative frequencies. So meaning if we only look at the kids that rode the bus, so of the 35 kids that rode their bus, 12 were tardy, that's about 34%. Of the 29 kids that went for their parents to school, 10 were tardy, it's about 34% as well. Of the kids that drove themselves to school, it's about 
31 out of 90. Again, also about 34%. And then finally, of the 34 kids that walked to school, we saw about 12 that were tardy or about 35%. So what we're noticing is that, you know, we start off with that marginal, about 34% of kids are tardy to school at least once during the week. But notice that if you ride the bus, about 34% tardy. If you drive to school with a parent, about 34% tardy. If you drive yourself to school, about 34% tardy. And if you walk to school, pretty darn close to about 34% are tardy. This is a sign of no association. Because what we're showing here is that, again, start off with that marginal. 34% of kids are tardy. However, if you arrived to school by bus, it didn't go up, it didn't go down, it stayed about 34%. If you drove with a parent, it didn't go up, it didn't go down, it stayed about 34%. If you drove yourself, it did not go up, it did not go down, it stayed at about 34%. Yeah, walking, I know, is a teeny bit more, it's about 35.3%, but again, it's really, really close to 34%. So what we're seeing is that the added conditions of how you got to school did not make it any more or less likely for you to be tardy. It's all around 34-ish percent. This isn't a sign of an association. When you attach a condition to a question and it doesn't change the marginal relative frequency, well then there's no association. Clearly how you arrive to school does not make you any more likely or less likely to be tardy. Now, that's in stark contrast to looking at this example. So here I'm using the same concept, the same idea, being tardy, yes or no, and how you got to school, but I changed the numbers a little bit. But first I want you to notice that the grand totals are all the same. It's the numbers within the table that I made different. Now, in this example, we're going to see that there is a clear association. For example, once again, we start off with the marginal relative frequency, where we see about 65 out of 188 kids were tardy to school, and get about that 34%. But this time, when we look at the kids that rode the bus, of the 35 kids that rode the bus, only four were tardy. Wow, it dropped to 11%. So again, something about riding the bus made you less likely, or there's less of a chance, that you are tardy. If you drove with a parent, Five out of those 29 kids were tardy, about 17%, also a little bit less than that marginal value. And if you drove yourself, of the 90 kids that drove themselves, 48 were tardy. That is now up to 53%. So we see that if you drive yourself to school, you are much more likely to be tardy. And then lastly, of the kids that walked to school, eight were tardy, and that's at about 24%. So here we're seeing very different numbers. The marginal relative frequency, that 34% number, is not matching up with the conditionals. That is a sign of an association because this is showing that when you add that added condition of, hey, I, I, I drive, you know, I go in the bus to get to school, it made me less likely to be tardy. And if I drive myself to school, it made me much more likely to be tardy. This is where we see that there is an association because those conditions change the probabilities or change the proportions. We can also see this concept of an association or not in the segmented bar graphs. Here's the seg segmented bar graphs for our data that showed no association. Notice, no matter how you get to school, bus, parent, self, or walk, about 34%, that's the bluish, that are tardy, and about 66%, that's the purple, that are not tardy. Again, showing that it doesn't change. Driving a bus, going with your parents, driving yourself, doesn't change those proportions, which means no association. Where well, here is the segmented bar graphs for the example where there is an association. We see that when you drive yourself to school, there is a change in a noticeable change in the proportion of kids that are tardy versus the proportion of kids that are not tardy. So we don't see the exact same numbers across the board. When you see the exact same numbers across the board, 34, 34, 34, 34%, that's a sign of no association. When you see a change of those conditional relative frequencies, that's a sign that there is an association. So make sure you know how to establish this, these concepts by looking at the segmented bar graphs or by looking at the two-way tables and then writing up a nice explanation of that. Now, from this section over analyzing two categorical variables measured from one set of data, what are some big things that are going to come up on your exam or on the AP exam? 
Well, the major things we're looking at are just calculating some of those different statistics that I mentioned. Can you calculate marginal distributions, joint distributions, or conditional distributions? Just being able to find those values in a two-way table is really, really simple and really, really easy to do, but it's definitely going to be asked of you. The second thing you're going to have to be able to do is answer that question, is there an association from looking at either a two-way table or looking at a segmented bar graph? That's a big concept, a big idea that is definitely going to come up on the AP exam for sure. All right, that's it for the Unit 2 Summary Video Part 1. Don't forget to watch the video for Part 2.